Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to our first fall presentation of, of our series. Uh, welcome to both of you who are here in the room and also the folks uh, participating through the webinar. Um, I am thrilled to uh, introduce my co-presenter today, Dr. Shanesha Sauls, the president and CEO of the Baltimore Community Foundation, uh, and appreciate her taking the time to join us here. Um, so for those of you who are um, seeking uh, CAE credit, uh, there's instructions in the materials you have, how to register for those, and this is eligible for CAE credit. Um, just to keep you apprised of upcoming events, as, as I think many of you know, Venable puts, uh, puts these educational seminars on every month. In October, we'll have one on maximizing association revenue in a flat dues environment. I know that a lot of folks who are involved in the trade association world struggling with uh, some financial economic issues, so we're going to talk about ways to help produce revenue outside the normal dues structure. In November, uh, we'll have an, uh, next session will be on sweepstakes, raffles, and other contests, which seems to be just a, a growing area. I, I find that we get questions about that all the time, so we look forward to that and, ask, and invite you to join both of those. So we'll get started uh, in a sec, and again, we've got in the room, we've got a standing microphone. There's a handheld microphone that if you just signal, we'll get to you. You should feel free to ask questions as we go along. Those participating in the webinar, I think you have instructions how to, how to post questions, and we'll try and respond as we go along. So, so uh, we'll, with that, we'll get started. So Ed, we as, an, as lawyers are always trying to think about, you know, what is the next new thing? What's coming? And we think about what are some disruptive industries. And if, you were to, if I were to ask any of you what you think of as disruptive industries, you would immediately think of the same list I'm giving you. We start with Airbnb uh, in the hospitality area. That's totally changed that industry. Uh, Uber in the ride-sharing industry. Now, if you walk away from this meeting with nothing else, I'm, listen to this thing, because this thing will be the most valuable information I give you. What I have learned, and I speak a lot and attend a fair number of meetings, the best icebreaker I know is to ask people in the room what their Uber rating is. It is absolutely phenomenal because I, I, was, I learned about this. I didn't realize you could get it yourself, but I realized I was in a meeting and people started comparing their Uber rating and I realized there was a guy who I, who I always thought of as a not nice person and realized he and I had the same rating. I then dedicated my life to raising my rating and I am pleased to acknowledge that I am now a solid 4.83. So there you go. In the currency area, Bitcoin is a disruptive industry, and in the philanthropic area, donor-advised funds are probably the most disruptive thing. Now, let me start with, you know, basic ways, how does one construct and carry out a philanthropic program? So the easiest way, of course, is simply to make donations to charity. Individuals, businesses, you just donate directly to charity. Second method would be establishing a charitable foundation. And that charitable foundation could either be a private foundation, that is a foundation that is funded only by a limited number of donors, or a public charity, one that has many donors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the third way of constructing a philanthropic program is by constructing what is called a donor advised fund. And frankly, you could do a combination of all of these. So let me start with what, what is a donor advised fund. This is an IRS definition. So the way the IRS finally got around to defining what a donor advised fund is, as part of the Tax Act in 2006, was it's a fund or an account created and held at another sponsoring charitable organization. So I have a charitable organization, like a community foundation, and I establish a fund at that charity. That fund is owned and controlled by the sponsoring charity. The money that's in it belongs to that sponsoring charity. 
the fund is separately identified by reference to contributions of a donor or donors. So we set up a fund at a charity that says this fund references the people who gave money to that fund. And that the donor or persons appointed by the donor, and those people are referred to as donor advisors, have advisory privileges. That is the privilege to recommend with respect to the distribution of funds or the investment of amounts held in the fund. So, Shanish, let me ask you, I mean, you in practice, how do you all, how does that whole process work, the advisory of grants and the advisory of investments? I mean, you've got real experience with it, so. So it can happen um, a number of ways. The most common way uh, that it can happen a number of ways. Is that better? Uh, the most common way is that our donors will contact us either via phone or online. Um, we have an online portal um, where they can ignite or initiate their own giving. Um, and so they will um, generate a series of recommendations. Uh, they interface with our uh, suite of staff that are um, designated and deployed um, to specifically deal with our donor advised funds and we help to facilitate their giving um, we do all of the back uh, office checking on their behalf so they don't have to sort of um, devote their time and energy on sort of the more administrative tasks um, and we support their advisements um, and um, in almost every case in fact in nearly every case we're able to facilitate uh, their giving uh, according to uh, their particular needs um, now in terms of the kinds of uh, donor advised funds that we may run into I mean we have individuals contact us um, the founder of the fund could contact us. We could have a successor um, um, who could include uh, their children. Um, we have corporations who will also set up donor advised funds. Uh, uh, so we try to make it an easy process um, and um, we use the advisory capacity not only to facilitate giving but also to build a relationship and to make sure they feel good about what they're doing and they're contributing to organizations that at least in our uh, footprint we believe are doing the best good for the community. How about in terms of investment selection? How does that work? Do, do they get to pick investments, or how, how does that work for them? So um, typically speaking, generally speaking, um, you um, when you sign up for our donor advised funds, you default into our investment strategy unless you are um, opening a fund at a certain level. So at the level of $5 million or above, your donor advised fund, um, you actually have the option, according to our uh, practice at this time, to select your individual advisor. Um, but um, for the most part, uh, donor advised funds below that amount default to a strategy that we're deploying at any given time. Um, in terms of donor advised funds, when they are non-endowed, we want to make sure they are as liquid as possible. So it's much more likely to be in a money market unless there's a specific conversation to use a different in, uh, investment vehicle. So now if you were lived in the world that we live in, and you probably see this, there is an article on donor advised funds literally every day in the paper. And um, I saw an article in Forbes that referred to the as donor advised funds as the beast, the beast that ate philanthropy. They're growing, they're big. But where do I find them? Where do, how do I find a donor? Where do I go to look for finding a donor advised fund? And there, there are essentially three options. The first are commercial, the commercial donor advised funds, places like Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab. All the financial institutions have their own donor advised funds. They're set up as a charity. At, if you use Fidelity, for example, there is a fund there that is a 501c3 charity, and you can contribute to that donor advised fund. So if you went to any commercial institution, you'd find that. Second would be the community foundations which are the historic home of donor advised funds. Now, historically, those at community foundations, and for those of you who know, there are community foundations in virtually every major community in the U.S., um, but their giving tends to be, by, by the nature, tends to be more regional. Now, in, in your experience, if I set up a donor advised fund, for example, at the Baltimore Community, community Foundation, am I limited to advising grants in the community, or can I go outside the community? So um, you have the options to give um, to whatever charity um, that is in good standing that you elect to, um, and you can advise and make those recommendations to us, and we will happily facilitate that on your behalf. Um, generally speaking, the reason that we find that people come to us as an option for their donor advised fund is because they want to give more often than not to the local community. Although, you know, if we sort of look at our corpus last year, 75% of our giving across all funds were in the Baltimore region. 
another 10% of last year's giving was in uh, the entire state of Maryland. And then the remainder of that, about 15%, was outside uh, of the state. So generally speaking, the uh, center of gravity for um, our corpus and for the donors who are attracted to our particular model is the Baltimore region. Um, however, um, our donors um, and our constituencies come from all over um, and they wanna support um, uh, efforts from all over. Um, and so from time to time we are able, we do and um, at their request facilitate those particular requests. Can I just say a, a bit about sort of what distinguishes different sorts of sponsoring organizations with respect to donor advised funds? So you know, one of the ways that you sort of think about the continuum of options is sort of um, how you want to participate in this particular form of philanthropy. Um, the way that I think about it um, is sort of my analogy um, is that sort of uh, you can go sort of for the big box, fidelity commercial. There's nothing wrong with that. Sort of you want the superstore model. Um, you do your own analysis of your time and your opportunity costs. Um, at the other end of the spectrum might be the small farmer's market. It's very, very limited, very focused, may only have one or two issues that, um, that it directs uh, funds to or um, types of organizations that it uh, direct funds to. And we're somewhere in the middle. Um, I like to think that we're sort of the boutique franchise grocer. Um, that we're large enough that we're able to um, understand the dynamics of the market regionally and lar um, at a larger scale. But we're, we're really focused on the needs of the specific, specific community and people come to us for a specific region, reason. Now, there are people who do all three of those. There are others um, in our corpus that really want to focus on the community foundation model because of the intellectual capital that we're able to deploy. Um, we consider our donors to be me like members of the family. Um, and uh, there are others that sort of do some combination of the three. Uh, so uh, while there is a continuum, they are different, and it's just sort of how you want to navigate your options, how you want to spend your time, and what kind of larger community you would like to be a part of. Now, the, uh, the, picking up on a point Janisha made, which is, and this is important, that although the historic homes of community f of um, donor advised funds are either in the commercial financial institutions or the community foundations, any chair, any public charity can establish a donor advised fund. So universities, and you'll see this all the time, universities can have a donor advised fund, hospitals can have a donor advised fund. Pretty much any charity can set up within itself donor advised funds. And that could be a neat trick if you're a, if you're a uh, charity and you're trying to think of a way to attract donors and, and donors are not sure what they want to do with their money using a donor advised fund inside the charity can be an effective tool to do that. So let's talk a little bit about um, why donor advised funds are being so much in the press and why they are perceived as so, uh, quote unquote, controversial. First of all, it is the fastest growing sector of the charitable industry. I, I read an article that said in 2016, people contributed $23 billion to donor advised funds, that the Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund is literally the largest charity in the US. I was looking at a tax return that they have over $16 billion of assets in the Fidelity Charitable Fund, which is, is just stunning, that there are well over 100,000 donors to the Fidelity Fund. And in 2017, over $4 billion was contributed to the donor advised funded fidelity. That is more money than say the United Way raised in that year. It's just, it's an incredible growth, growth situation, which is why people are anxious because the rules, it's moving too fast for the rules that are out there. And the Internal Revenue Service, which is charged with regulating donor advised funds or DAFs, is really just getting their hands around it and starting to regulate that. So let's talk about next, you know, what is the attraction of a donor advised fund? Shanisha, yeah, let me start with you. I mean, you, you live in that world. What do, what do you perceive? Why do people come to you and say, this is attractive to me? Um, so I think it's a combination of, I think, three factors. Um, <clears throat> I think first, um, if you have um, an opportunity to, um, if you have a, a taxable event and you're thinking about the best way to um, address that taxable event, 
Um, the question is, do you write um, an extra check to a public agency or do you determine that you want to make that um, money, um, put that money to work in the community to reduce your tax obligation, but also to increase um, your impact in the community? So one would just be sort of looking at um, the fact that there's an opportunity um, based on um, um, our obligations as citizens to give to a, a donor advised fund. Um, I think the second has to do with how you want to spend your time, right? So we have people who come to us um, where they know that they need to um, and they want to open a donor advised fund or they want to make a, a considerable, um, um, but, well, by our metrics of considerable, not the, <laughs> the typical, um, the public discourse um, a, a version of typical, a sizable um, contribution to their donor advised fund, but they're not quite sure how they want to spend the money. Um, and they don't want to sort of just go through the piles of letters, the appeal letters that you get at certain times of the year. Um, and they don't want to take the time to go through their checkbook and go online and make sure you've got the right, right website and you've got the card and you're trying to cook dinner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they don't, they see an opportunity cost there, right? And so they'll come to us to say, you know, we want to sort of put this money in here now, but we don't want to have the flexibility to adjudicate among our options. But we want to take care of the tax, the tax issue first. And then we can talk together through the relationship that the donor services team has with the particular donor to sort of facilitate those costs, right? And so it's just, you know, again, just kind of thinking through your opportunity costs in terms of how you want to spend your time and how you want to best deploy that money um, in a way that can be really impactful and really be more strategic than just sort of writing a series of checks to meet the immediate need. And I think the third um, is, you know, again, because community foundations, in, in our case, we're really about sort of building um, a, a broader community of people who care about the quality of life in the re region across arts and culture and education and neighborhood development and basic human needs. Um, um, we find that people want to be a part of something larger. And so while um, whatever the cost of their um, contribution, let's say they're going to put in $25,000, while in the scheme of things that doesn't seem so big, you're actually going to be a part of a bigger corpus. And there's a sense that there's sort of this connectivity to being a part of the broader community um, that's appealing to our donors. And they like to hear about um, what's happening in the community. And um, I think they like to be a part of a, a larger um, momentum. So that's been my experience. So... In terms of, you know, characterizing some of the, you know, other issue reasons you hear people saying, I like a donor advised fund, one is it's incredibly simple. You know, you can literally establish one in five minutes. You go to Fidelity, you go to a community foundation, you go to the charity, and you say, I want to set this up. It can be done in five minutes. You simply sign a, a, a form agreement. It's a relatively easy agreement, and you're done. You're in business. You have established your donor advised fund at the charity. As opposed to, you know, when you form a found, your own foundation, that takes time. You have to incorporate the foundation, and you apply to the IRS for, for a determination letter. The donor advised fund is a part of an existing charity, and therefore I can walk in the door. Let's say I decide on December 31, <clears throat> oh, my God, I need a deduction. You can walk in on December 31, and I'm sure people always fight over who's going to be in the office on December 31, much like our firm. We've already um, decided. You know, it, it's, but, and you can simply, all you do, you sign the agreement. It's already an existing charity. You put your money in, you get your deduction. So you avoid the time and the cost of forming your own foundation. Now, again, because your um, fund is part of this existing charity that's, that's already out there, you're just part of them, so you don't have to file a separate tax return for the fund. It's included in the donor advised funds tax return. You uh, don't have to go out and get your own financials because it's all part of the, of the donor advised fund. Now, one other reason which I, I've seen in my own practice of people liking donor advised funds is sometimes when people are seeking anonymity. And they, they want to make a grant to something, but they really don't want people to know who the grant came from. So what they'll do is they'll establish a donor advised fund. They'll put the money into the donor advised fund, get their deduction. And then when the money comes out of the donor advised fund to the ultimate recipient, and they'll simply say, you got a grant from the ex donor advised fund. Doesn't necessarily have to recognize the donor. And I, I had one situation where a donor was so concerned about anonymity, that what he did is he spread his money among donor advised funds at eight different community foundations around the country, none of which were in the community he lived, 
And there, he just had all of them make a grant to the ultimate recipient, and no one ever knew it was his money. Yeah, so um, I was sharing um, this uh, convening with some members of the team, and I asked um, one particular member of the staff, sort of, what's your favorite story? And um, about, I guess, 12 years ago, prior to my tenure, um, we had a family, we have a family that come into a tremendous windfall, um, and they'd already set up a donor advised fund. And um, through a series of very intelligent investments and um, some other series of, of, of uh, instances um, in the family, uh, he came into another very large windfall. And he called and he said, I'm wealthy enough. <clears throat> I don't want this money to hit my checkbook. Um, I would like to set up another donor advice fund, but I, didn't want, I don't want anyone to know about it. Um, he, doesn't, he didn't want a press release. And uh, he set up the donor advised fund, um, set up the plan for administering the money, uh, made it unrestricted based on the needs of the community. Um, but it would be an ex excellent example of someone who just wanted to do good, looked in our case to, its, uh, to his local uh, community foundation, um, and wanted to deploy the money without attention time or anything. So it was great. Wonderful story. You know, a question's been posed about if I'm uh, a charity and I want to set up a donor advised fund, let's say I'm a university and I want to set up a donor advised fund, can, can all the money in that donor advised fund go to the university? And the answer is yes, at the moment that is fine. Now typically what you'll see is someone will set up a donor advised fund at a university and they might say, I want to recommend that part of it goes to the physics department, and part goes to the the heaven forbid, the athletics department, and some may go to the English department or whatever. But yes, it's possible to have a donor advised fund at a charity where all the money goes to that charity. Now, some other reasons that people find donor advised funds attractive are donor advised funds, because they're at an existing charity, an existing public charity, they are considered contributions to a public charity. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a little while, but you get the better deduction limits that apply to public charities as opposed to giving it to a private foundation. And we'll talk about some practical uh, examples of that. And again, as Shanisha said, the thing that's really, one of the reasons that people really like donor advised funds is I can put the money in the donor advised fund now, take my deduction, but then the money doesn't have to go out of that fund till down the road. And if you remember, you might have read at the end of the year, of last year, when the tax, new tax bill came in, and a lot of people thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to take a charitable deduction because I'm no longer going to itemize. A lot of people, a lot of smart people, ran in, set up donor advised funds, put it all in at the end of, of 2017, took the tax deduction, and then they'll filter it out over time as, as gifts. Now, again, one of the things about that, as you would expect, that a donor advised fund is, is marked by is donors get to advise where gifts go, they get to recommend, they can't mandate. And so technically, the, the sponsor of the donor advised fund has a veto over that. The, in theory, the sponsor of the donor advised fund could say, no, we're not gonna do that one. I don't know how, how you all think about that in terms of when you look at recommendations, how you decide whether you might veto that. My experience has been, they rarely get vetoed, but. Um, very rarely. Um, the only cases where we would actually exercise our veto is if there was an issue with compliance of the, excuse me, the only instance where we would typically exercise the veto is if there was an, uh, an instance of um, noncompliance. So the organization to which they wanted to give um, had a lapse in its 501c3 status. Um, we would have to contact the donor um, and the fund holder and to, to inform them that we're not going to be able to release the money, and this is why. Um, there have also been a few occasions, very rarely, where um, there have been, um, because of our intellectual capital in the, in the community, where we are aware that there may be a solvency issue. Um, and we will not um, refuse to release the check, but we may contact the donor to warn them that there may be a solvency issue. Now, there are all kinds of good reasons why someone would want to issue the check anyway, but we want to make sure that the donor is educated about the potential risks, uh, and then we leave it up to them. But generally speaking, the veto is only exercised in a case of noncompliance with regulations. Now, in one thing to keep in mind, and this goes to the question that the prior person asked a little bit, is if I set up a donor advised fund that only benefits one charity, the IRS gives you a little bit of a break here and says, 
because it's only one charity, we're not going to consider that a donor advised fund subject to all the donor advised fund rules. So if I, again, using my example, set up a fund and I say it can only benefit the university, then I don't have to comply with a lot of the rules that apply to donor advised funds. And that's a neat trick um, for someone who has a particular charity in mind. Most people have multiple charities, so it, it may not happen. And then finally, what you'll notice when people do set up a uh, a donor advised fund with a very specific purpose in it, typically the sponsoring charity will maintain what's called a variance power. That is, if something happens where it's obsolete or you can't do it anymore, the university went out of business, something like that, that they can change uh, where, where the money goes. Now, let's talk a little bit about who can be an advisor of a donor advised fund. And there, there are lots of, there's a lot of flexibility in this. Typically, it'll be an individual. It'll typically be the donor or maybe members of the donor's family. You can set up a, um, an advisory committee of, to advise the donor advised fund. And quite often, that'll have multiple. Some funds have multiple donors. And you'll have a committee that consists of a group of the donors. You can put experts on as part advisors. Let's say it's, you set up a fund and your real interest is environmental matters, you can have on your advisory group somebody who's an, a professor or someone who's an expert in environmental matters. In, quite often, you'll see companies or corporations set up donor advised funds, and there they will tend to have representatives of the company as the advisors with the advisory privilege. Now, I'll talk a little bit about disaster relief funds, which is another use of donor advised funds, a good use of donor advised funds, and I'll, there's some special rules on how those get advised, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So then the question becomes, well, how do you have succession of, of advisors? What my, originally, the donor designates him or herself as the advisor. Who succeeds? And Shanita, I don't know how you all do this. And so um, we write the successor policy in the original fund agreement. Um, so typically, we will have in the fund agreement um, one round of succession um, embedded in the agreement um, with uh, language that any uh, further uh, successors um, would have to be um, recommended but ultimately approved by the community foundation. So we try to deal with succession issues sort of three generations out or so um, in a way that's respectful of uh, the, the founder's intent. Um, but there's an understanding that um, uh, the third round of successor um, really has to sort of um, meet with our level of approval, approval because often the founder may not still be there. So since we're sort of starting this donor advised fund together, uh, we named the second round, but the third round um, can come up for our um, approval um, as needed. Um, and they, we rarely see any issues with that. And it actually gives us an opportunity to form relationships with the successors. You know, we've got a question about can a donor advised fund make a... One of the things I love about this series of, of uh, conferences we do is people who are very smart, you get really smart questions, but someone has asked, can a donor advised fund contribute to a 501c4 organization? That is a non-charity for charitable purposes. And the answer is yes, as long as the, as long as the donor advised fund exercises what's called expenditure responsibility over that grant. That is, it, it has reporting back and forth between the C4. It's fact, it's any non-501c3. You can make a grant for a charitable purpose as long as you exercise expenditure responsibility. And then finally, in the appointment of advisors, typically the grant, the agreement you set up with the, with the DAF will say, will explain how the appointment of successors happens. Is it the existing people who do it? Is it one person who does it? You know, quite often you'll see that in family situations where the patriarch or the matriarch will want to control who becomes successors. So there's some, some flexibility built in there. Now, so let's turn to uh, a comparison of donor advised funds and private foundations, because that's what people often talk about is, which is better? What's the difference? Why, why should I do one versus the other? So as we talked about, let's talk about private foundations first. In a private foundation, what you have is a separate corporation, or it could be a trust, with a separate board of directors. You apply to the IRS on Form 1023. It's a complicated application. It usually takes the IRS six months or so to act on it retroactively to when you incorporate it. Um, it has a separate tax return for the foundation, separate financial reporting. So there's some work involved in it. Now, for those of you who work with private foundations, 
there are also uh, a series of taxes and, and excise taxes that apply to private foundations that don't apply to donor advised funds. So the, you have the, self de the prohibition against self-dealing, which means foundations cannot interact with related parties. They can't have transactions with related parties. That, and this will come to this in a little bit, but one of the significant differences at the moment, and this is one of the issues that's fairly controversial right now, in private foundations have to distribute 5% of their assets every year. Donor advised funds currently are not required to distribute 5% or any percent of money at any given time. How do you, what do you find in practice? I mean, this is an area that people are, that people are looking at. Is, is it fair that these money goes into the donor advised fund, you get a deduction, and nothing has to go out? How, what are you seeing? So um, let me say this first. Um, I'm always worried when we um, make attempts at policymaking using extreme cases, and I think it's probably quite unfortunate, um, and hopefully at some point cooler uh, heads will prevail. Um, it's quite unfortunate that um, we're in an environment where we are, we, it feels very reactive and we're taking very, very extreme cases and we're trying to make policy out of it. Um, for those of us who do this work every day, um, the public discourse on donor advised funds and that kind of activity is actually seems light years away from how we actually experience the work. Um, so what we find is that most donor advised funds, the vast majority of our donor advised funds are active. Um, now, that is to say, and I will just say that there are instances, so let me just pivot for a bit. There are instances where someone wants to or a family wants to grow their donor advised fund over time. They want to grow the principal over time, and then they want to start giving money, and that's okay, right? Because um, in many respects, the donor advised fund is an investment. So they may want to make the immediate um, gift to the donor advised fund, but they don't want to start giving out grants immediately. They want to grow the principal to a certain amount, or they want their children to reach a certain age, um, or they, they want to encourage members of the family to start contributing, and then they will start giving out gifts. And so our relationship with our donors allows them to do that. Now, we have, because of our particular commitments where we are in Baltimore, um, we recently um, recommended to our board, and it was accepted, that we put a five-year limitation on the growth of, of, of principal. So we do ask all donor-advised funds so that they are not deemed inactive by our definition that they give at least one grant over a five-year period. The size of that grant can be um, as large or as small as necessary, but there is a sense that we want to make sure that we're deploying capital. That said, I'll just sort of state the point again, there are very good reasons to want to grow the principle of your donor advice fund over time before you start giving out grants. And my hope is that as we enter this policy making um, period around donor advised funds, that we think less about the atypical case of an eight to nine figure gift to the more typical case, which tends to be anywhere from a five to a seven figure gift, and sort of what that means for the large part of the, the clients and constituencies that we serve. Um, and so I feel very strongly about that, and I would also hope that community foundations, given sort of the, our role in this donor advised fund um, field, um, that our voices are actually really considered um, as we proceed. So thank you for the soapbox moment. That's okay. Thank you for so, and again, limitations on a private foundation that don't apply to donor-advised funds. So in a private foundation, there are limits on how much stock or partnership interest can be held. These are what, this is what's called the excess business holding rule. Generally, private foundations can only hold about 20% of a business, and that 20% gets reduced by amounts held by people related to the foundation. There's a 2% a tax on net investment income of a foundation doesn't apply to a donor advised fund. In a private foundation, if you want to have a scholarship program, that has to be pre-approved by the IRS, and there's a form where you can get it pre-approved by. And then there are lower deduction limits that apply to private foundations than would apply to a donor advised fund, because a donor advised fund is a public charity, and those are, I was to make myself a little matrix to remember this, but after the Tax Act for cash gifts, you, get a sick, you can deduct up to 60% of AGI for public charity, 30% if it's a private foundation for appreciated property, it's 30% to a public charity, 20% to a private foundation, and most significantly, we'll come back to this because this is a big difference, when you make a gift of stock or partnership interests, other than some publicly traded stock issues, 
In a private foundation, your deduction is limited to basis, cost basis. To a donor-advised fund, you get to deduct it at fair market value, and that can be a significant difference. Just to answer one question, somebody asked a question about can you uh, make an annual contribution to a donor-advised fund of, say, 25000 and then each year provide a list of charities uh, to the donor-advised fund saying, I want to give X dollars to each particular charity? And the answer to this is yes, that's exactly how a donor-advised fund would operate. Now, let's talk about what some of the differences with a donor-advised fund. As we talked about, it's a fund of an existing charity, so there's no separate corporation. There's no IRS application because you're simply part of the, don of the donor advised fund sponsoring charity. There's no separate tax return or audit. You don't have to file any state registrations. You know the state registrations that charities have to file if, they, if charities fundraise, they have to file, register in the states where they fundraise. You don't have to do that with a donor advised fund because the sponsoring charity has already done that. It's not a pretty good, huh? But I'll get to, I'll get to the negatives too. Um, we talked about the higher deduction limits. Importantly, you can still get name recognition. So people say, well, if I give to a donor advised fund, that no one will know it came from me. But I can name my fund at the donor advised fund after the family, after the business. It can be the John Smith Fund at the donor advised fund. And again, as we talked about, again, there are no minimum distribution requirements. So I guess I would ask you the other side of the question. I mean, what do you hear? What do people come to you and say, what don't they like about donor advised funds? What, what do you hear as things that they're worried about? So um, in my experience, it's more a, a generational difference. So um, as you know, there's a lot of conversation about the next generation. Um, the next generation, whether we're talking about fourth or fifth generation um, of what I consider our bread and butter constituencies, or we're talking about um, transplants that may not have been acculturated to philanthropy with a capital P, people don't really understand what a donor advised fund is. Um, and so a lot of what, if there are any negatives associated with them, they're just trying to figure out why would I, quote unquote, park my money um, um, on the assumption that I don't deploy it. And it's like, oh, no, 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 that's exactly what you're not doing, right? Um, you're actually creating um, an account where you are placing your money for a period of time um, until you decide in consultation with whomever is advising or facilitating your philanthropy where you want to direct your money. So what we're finding at this particular time where we are um, in Baltimore is it's more so a generational difference where people are trying to wrap their head around what is this thing called a donor advised fund that my great grandmother set up or that my grandmother set up um, or, you know, I now um, own a new startup company in a certain area of, of, the, of the region and um, I want to help the community. What makes a donor advised fund more appealing, particularly given what the public discourse is saying about, um, about donor advised funds? We do get lots of questions about fees. Um, so, you know, if you go back to my example about sort of how you want to navigate your choices, um, because we are the boutique model, um, our fees are different um, from the fees read higher um, than the fees that you might see at a commercial brokerage, but that's because the, the the concierge service that I like to think that the team deploys on behalf of our donors. We're a family, so we interface by technology over the phone, and in some cases, I'm looking at my colleague in the back, she actually goes to people's homes um, to help them facilitate their giving. So the fees sometimes become a sticking point, um, but again, you have to decide that combination of um, how you want to spend your time, think about your opportunity costs. Um, the pros and cons of the taxable event that you're trying to negotiate, and what kind of community you want to be a part of. So, in addition, you know, things that you hear as limitations of donor advised funds, again, as a, the IRS is just starting to look at these, so there are, the rules are somewhat unclear and subject to change. Now, one of the things the IRS says, uh, and this is a, a, probably an important difference, with a donor advised fund, there's a rule that says, you, in a, simply, you can't benefit, you can't use the fund to benefit donors. There can't be grants, loans, compensation, or similar payments to donors or donor advisors or their families. So for those of you who are familiar with the private foundation world, where there's an exception to the self-dealing rules, which permits you to pay related persons for personal services and furtherance of the exemption, and people always joke, that's where you take your ne'er-do-well nephew and you let them work at the private foundation, and that gives you a way to pay the ne'er-do-well nephew. In a donor advised fund, you can't do that. They don't have the same exception. You can't use the fund to provide economic benefits to the donor 
or the donor advisors or the family. Now, what, the, what you can do is the IRS lets you have, quote unquote, what they call incidental benefits to the donor. And the way they define that is, let's say I set up a donor advised fund and my mother is in the hospital and the hospital has done a great job. And I want to advise a grant out of my donor advised fund to the hospital where my mother is. That's fine. Or my, my child is uh, in the Boy Scouts and I want to make a grant to the Boy Scouts because I think it's great. That's okay. That's what's considered an incidental benefit. Now, one other limitation is, um, and I'll talk about some exceptions in a minute, in a donor advised fund, you are not permitted to make payments to individuals. Now, there's a special rule for scholarship funds, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, in the donor advised fund, although you don't have the self-dealing rules that apply to private foundations, but there is the same rule that applies to all charities that you can't have sweetheart deals with related persons. That's the excess benefit rule. Again, what you hear really is that in a donor advised fund, donors only have advisory rights as opposed to their own foundation where they are the king of the kingdom. In a donor advised fund, I recommend grants, but in theory, the, do the sponsor of the donor advised fund could veto it if they wanted to. Now, so you're giving up a little bit of control for simplicity. That's sort of the, the basic thing. And then what you see in some donor advised funds, and not all, some of them won't accept difficult assets. If you have assets like closely held stock that's not marketable, that there's no exit strategy with, or artwork or antiques or whatever, some donor advised funds won't take that kind of asset because they're saying we can't manage something that's, that's difficult. I don't know how you, what your experience. So generally speaking, that is our, um, that is our assumption that if something is not um, easily liquidated, uh, we hesitate to accept it. Um, but prior to saying no, it's always a conversation. Um, and so we would um, actually um, look to our attorney and we have a gift acceptance committee that would help us navigate those very rare uh, cases where we were concerned that we have an illiquid gift um, um, that's contributed to a donor advised fund. That's right, Bob. We've got a question over. So what about uh, IRA uh, transfers um, uh, that don't have a, donate, uh, a donor benefit? We do take IRA transfers, but we um, ask that the donor, we actually recently had this case confirmed with uh, their accountant, his accountant, and we also check internally, um, but we do accept them. So, again, as I mentioned, that the general rule is that um, donor advised funds cannot make payments to individuals, but there is an exception for scholarships. And the way the exception works is that if you have a committee established by the, the sponsoring organization, sponsor, the, the organization that sponsors the donor advised fund, and the donor can be a member of that committee but can't be in the majority, they can have a minority position on that committee, and the scholarships are awarded on objective criteria that's approved by the sponsoring charity, then you can do scholarships through the donor advised fund. Now, let me talk for a minute about um, international giving, um, because that is another ro role that uh, donor advised funds can play. For those of you familiar with the private foundation rules, when private foundations go to make grants internationally, they have to exercise one of two methodologies. This, this is a whole conference in and of itself, but there are two different methodologies. One is called um, making an equivalency determination, and the other is called exercising expenditure responsibility. If I'm a private foundation and I want to make a grant abroad, I have to either exercise expenditure responsibility, which means it's a detailed set of reporting back and forth between the foundation and the foreign charity, or I do equivalency, which is the private foundation has to make a determination that the foreign charity is the equivalent of a U.S. charity. And what that involves generally is you usually have to get a lawyer to give an opinion that it is the equivalent. Alternatively, and again, this is a whole other topic, there, there are these repositories of foreign charities that other people have already vetted and determined are good charities. And there are entities, the one that is well, best known is this one, TechSoup, which you may be familiar with, which will, in effect, sell their lists of vetted charities to other foundations to use. But there's a lot of work in doing international philanthropy out of a private foundation. Now, in the donor advice fund world, there are donor advised funds, these international donor advised funds, and the ones that I'm familiar with are uh, probably the most 
well known of them as CAF, CAF America, CAF stands for, I think it stands for Charities Aid Foundation. It's CAF America, United Way Worldwide, Give to Asia. There are a bunch of them, and they are international donor advised funds. They look just like every other donor advised fund, but they grant internationally, and they will do all that work for you. They, they do all that work that the foundation would have to do. Now, there's a fee for it, but they will do that for you. So that's another use of donor advised funds. Let me turn now to um, disaster relief. And it's, you know, this is obviously topical because of recent events in, in the Carolinas. And where this comes into play typically, where you see this come in most often, is companies who have operations around the country, that are, or frankly around the world. There is a disaster, a natural disaster, and they want to help their employees who've been affected by that natural disaster. And so what they'll do is, the, one of the pro challenges with that is, you have, if you only have three employees in the area that was affected, that's too small to be a charitable class. You have to have a broad charitable class of people affected. So what some people do is they will create a donor advised fund, and quite honestly, you often see these at community foundations, which has a specific purpose of disaster relief. And what will happen is the, 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 donor, the community foundation will set up a donor advised fund to help all natural disasters. So by definition, it broadens the class of potential beneficiaries. And then employers can contribute to that donor advised fund. And then there will be a committee set up at the donor advised fund at the sponsoring charity. Because one of the things the IRS won't let you do is have, if you're a company, they won't let you staff the committee with people only at the company who supervise your employees, because then it begins to look like an employee benefit. But what the community foundations will do, they'll have a fund with an independent group of people who look at each person's harm and how much they lost and how were they hurt and can make grants out of the donor advised fund. So that's a very good use of donor advised funds. And also, Shanishi, I mean, outside of the employer context, and I'm sure you saw it in, in Florence, that. I mean, the donor advised funds are a traditional place where we try to help people out who've been affected by charity, by, by disasters. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, what we do, generally speaking, is we will direct our donors um, to the local community foundation um, to um, direct their gifts there. Um, and we're happy to facilitate uh, gifts from their donor advised fund to the local community foundation. Uh, but again, because we believe strongly in the intellectual capital, of the community foundation, particularly around disaster relief and making sure that the money gets to um, where it's supposed to get to and uh, that the needs are, are met. Um, that is our practice um, at the Baltimore Community Foundation. Uh, we connect with our peers and we and we direct the money in, in that way. I was going to wait for the microphone. Okay. Um, my question about disaster relief, the way this is being presented, is that it has to go to individuals. Can it also go to, say, government organizations or nonprofits that are serving the communities to, to reinvest in the community? Yes. Right. That would be like the traditional donor advised grant to the Red Cross or to uh, the, you know, the local food bank in the community. That would be treated just like any other grant you make out of a donor advised fund. So, and you'll see that quite often where the community foundation will pool money. Um, Cause quite often what happens, I mean, we see this is that you want to help and you don't know who to give it to. And so you pool the money at, at the organization that's on the ground, the community foundation or whoever, and let them figure out what's the best way to control the money. Now a question has been raised as to can, um, a DAF make gifts to advocacy groups or political organizations. This is this no different than the rules that apply to any other charitable organization. You know, you can't get involved in political activity. Um, you can't make grants to political organizations. That's pro it's, it's just like every other 501c3. That's prohibited. Same thing on lobbying. The you know limitations on lobbying. If you've made the the 501h election where you can do some. Um, some lobbying, you can do that. It's no different than any other charity. So, yes, it can, make, it can make grants to advocacy groups subject to the same limitations that apply to all other charities, not to political organizations. Now, um, so let's talk about when, when can a DAF really be a helpful situation? When is it, a, when is it really a, a uniquely... Uh, good organization. Let me talk to you, let's turn to you a little bit. When do you see where people really say, this DAF can really solve my problem? Uh, 
Um, I think generally speaking, it's um, because they want someone to help them give um, in a way that maximizes benefits to the community. Um, uh, people, um, there's th the need is um, sometimes it seems as if it's multiplying. Um, and there's a real conversation around how do I have the greatest impact and, and what organizations among a sea of organizations are doing the best work. Or, and uh, they come to us and they think that the donor advice fund allows them to be strategic. Um, so it's not only um, a transactional uh, tool, it can very much be a strategic tool to that sort of think about what kinds of um, organizations you want to give to or causes that you want to give to. So I think that people find DAFs to be very helpful in that regard. Um, there's a, um, a real sense of accomplishment um, when you receive your quarterly statement or um, if by request you have your, state, your statement at the end of the year and you can see the organizations that you've given to. Um, and you can review that information with members of our team uh, to figure out um, what the next year or the subsequent years uh, should look like. Um, it's a huge relief to just get that single tax receipt at the end of the year and not to have to worry about, again, the piles of appeal letters uh, that start coming around about uh, a week or two before Thanksgiving. Um, you don't have to deal with that. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a huge relief to sort of focus your energy on where do I want to give, not sort of the administrative hassle and all the paperwork that comes um, behind it. Um, the other thing um, that um, that I've actually just stumbled across is we have, um, and I'll just say really quickly, we have a, a donor who um, throughout um, her time, she's given to particular kinds of causes. Um, and she really feels like the, the, the city and the country is in a moment where we need to sort of rethink and sort of aggregate money. And so she's asked a member of our staff to um, form a meeting with um, other holders of donor advised funds whom this staff member believes might be interested in this conversation to figure out how they can pull their money together to focus on these issues as a conversation. Um, and so that's sort of where we are in this moment. I think people um, find that to be very helpful. Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, in my own practice, you know, what I've seen also is, look, as we talked about, it's really simple. Somebody walks in the door and says, I, I want to give money to charity. I this is a really simple way to do it. People will say, how much should I... Uh, and you ask 100 lawyers this, you get 100 different answers. But people will say, how much money do I need to contribute to start my own foundation? And again, it depends who you ask. I always tell people, if you're not going to uh, contribute at least over time a million dollars, then I would not set up a foundation. I think the administration of a foundation is just not worth it at that point in time. Now, others will give you a different number. Some will give you a higher number. Some will give you a lower number. I, that's the number I've picked. Um, others will debate that number. Um, again, setting up a donor advice fund, very little startup expense. You know, you don't need lawyers, accountants, whatever. You just go set it up. Uh, now, this is, this is an, an interesting one. And again, this is one I think you're going to see more legislation on. As I mentioned, your foundations have to give away 5% of their assets every year. And what happens is the foundation gets to the end of the year and goes, we, have, we don't have 5%. We didn't get to 5% this year. And they panic. They go, how can I get up to 5%? They set up a donor advised fund and just distribute the, what they need to, the delta that they haven't given away into the donor advised fund. Just met my 5%. Now, commentators hate this because they say nothing has gone to charity at that point in time. I put it in a private foundation. Nobody didn't help anyone. The foundation panicked at the end put it in the donor advised fund, they're home free, but yet no one has gotten any money yet. That's the criticism of this. And I think we'll see something on that one. Um, if you need higher deduction limits, let's say you've got um, closely held stock and you have a sale transaction coming, a, liqui a liquidity transaction coming up, and you're going, wait a minute, I don't want to recognize all that income. I, I, need to, I need to shelter some income. Where can I put my closely held stock quickly so that when the sale happens, I don't pay tax on that donor advised fund is a way you could do that. That's a, an interesting way to do it. Um, it's let, a great way to do it. Yes. <laughs> now, others, and I've seen this before, is where someone will give closely held stock to charity, take the deduction, and then down the road, they, that that's closely held stock really is of no value to the, to the donor advised fund. They can't do anything with it. You can't, you know, you can't feed people with closely held stock. It's not, it's not helpful. So what they do is the donor will put the closely held stock into the donor advised fund, take a deduction, and then buy the stock back down the road. Then the, the donor advised fund has money to do charitable things, and the person has the stock back. And if that transaction happens with some frequency. 
Again, we talked about international giving. I want to, as, as a good use of donor advised fund, disaster, a disaster hits and I need to move quickly. There's not enough time to set up a foundation. Donor advised fund can be a good thing to do. And again, as we talked about, if I want a current deduction, but I'm not sure where I want the money to go, I can put it in a donor advised fund and then decide later where it ultimately goes. Now, let me talk about, yeah, can, Dave, can you? I want the people in the webinar to hear your question. Is it on? There. So the last transaction you talked about, closely held stock, donated, you take the tax deduction. Donor then buys it back from them? Fair market value. Is that a, ta a deduction? No, that is right. not a deduction. So they buy it back, then they have it, and then they can donate it again. They could if they wanted to. So, um, so let me turn now to... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what about from the perspective of the recipient of the charitable giving? Is there any difference between getting the money from the donor advised fund versus getting it directly versus getting it from a private foundation? I'm going to talk about that in 30 seconds. Okay. So you. you're, you're right. Um, I have a question about, um, can we explain why a contribution from a DAF cannot be used to satisfy an individual pledge? I'll come to that in a few minutes, too. So this is now the point where this is the what's the fuss moment. What's everybody worked up about? What are you here? What's the problem? So the IRS knows they're, they're worried. They're worried because this is growing so quickly. It's moving fast. The dollars, as I mentioned, going into donor advised funds is enormous. And the IRS hasn't regulated particularly well. So now they're worried. So a little while ago, they issued a notice hinting at some things that they were worried about and things that we might hear about. And I want to highlight those for you because I think this is where things may be going. So here are some of the things they worry about. And frankly, I've, and I've been holding off, people on the webinar and yourselves have asked every one of these questions. So I'm going to hit all of them now. Here's the first one, the ticket purchase. Now, if you know, if, for those of you familiar with private foundations, this is the issue that causes people enormous heartburn, which is if my fa I set up a foundation and I want to buy tickets to an event, can I use my foundation to buy tickets to an event? Now, the IRS, who appear to be the only people who have never gone to an event and somehow think <laughs> it's a privilege to eat that chicken, um, <laughs> here's what the IRS says is, no, we don't like this because if you use foundation money to buy a table at an event, and then you're going to have people sit at the table who are not foundation people. They are friends. Uh, it's a social event, business, customers. Then what you've done is use your foundation to subsidize having non-foundation people sit at the table. And we don't like that, and we're not going to let you do that. Well, then smart people came back and said, how about this one? We'll have the foundation pay the charitable piece of the ticket, and then the company or the individuals will pay the non-charitable piece. I right, said, so we don't like that one either, because what's happening there is if you didn't get the foundation to pay for the charitable piece, you couldn't go to the event. So we don't like that. We're not going to let foundations essentially, basically the same, foundations can't buy tables unless only foundation employees or foundation staff go to the event. Now, one of the things the IRS has hinted at in this notice that just came out is, you know what? We're going to do the same thing with donor advised funds. We're going to make the same rule with donor advised funds. We're not going to let you use your donor advised fund to buy tickets to events and then have, you know, the family, the friends, the, the neighbors, the business associates, the clients go to it. Not going to let you do it. So that's coming down the pipe. The second one, and this is, uh, someone asked this exact question on the webinar. Um, in the private foundation world, there's a rule that says if an individual makes a pledge personally, the foundation can't pick up that person's pledge. And, and this is how it comes up all the time. You see this all the time where, you know, the individual, and I get it, because the individual donor, he sees this as all his money or her money, so the donor says, walks in and he's, he's at a charity thing. He says, I'm going to give you a million dollars. Then he turns to the founda his foundation and says, write him a check for a million dollars. And that's a problem because in the private foundation world, the foundation cannot pick up a pledge by a related party. 
Interestingly, in the DAF world, one of the things the IRS has hinted at, and I found this bizarre, is they've hinted at that they're going to take a different approach with a donor advised fund. They're going to take kind of a uh, don't ask, don't tell sort of approach. That if if uh, if I come to the donor, my donor advised fund, I said, could you make a grant to the hospital? As long as I don't tell them. Oh, by the way, that's a personal pledge of mine that you're satisfying. And as long as the recipient doesn't say, oh, thank you, that's, that's satisfying your personal pledge, it's okay. The IRS is saying that's okay. And that was a surprise. So the IRS seems to be hinting that they're not going to worry about if the DAF satisfies a personal pledge. So that's an interesting dynamic. So now what you will see is the IRS still worrying about when people, and I didn't even, it's amazing to me, you know, you hear about these things and you think, who thought of those? But you know that thing where people still use their foundations to pay for their college you know, football tickets and whatnot, that's still going to be a problem. But this personal pledge thing looks like in the donor advised fund, it won't be. Now, um, one of the things, again, the IRS has hinted that they're going to look at is, and this goes to, a, this gets a little bit complicated, but one other reason people use DAFs is somebody asked the question, does it matter to the recipient if the money comes from a DAF? Does it come from an individual? Does it come from some, the government? This goes to the, what is called the public charity status of the recipient. If I'm a public charity, I have to show I get money from a broad set of donors. So if I get a big grant from one donor, that can be a problem. So if an individual makes a big grant to a charity, that could ruin their public charity status. If it comes from another public charity, that's not a problem. The IRS says, we're not going to worry about that. That's OK. And so one of the traditional roles of, of community foundations and DAFs is funnel the money through the DAF to the recipient charity. It won't hurt their public charity status. The IRS says they're going to look at that. That's something they're worried about. They don't like that. And they're, they're, what they're going to do is potentially make you look through to the donor, to the real donor, to determine whether it's a public charity. Um, other issues that we think they're going to look at is how to private, can private foundations count contributions to public char to, I'm sorry, can private foundations count distributions to DAFs as part of their 5%? Currently, they absolutely can. Absolutely. It's no different than giving to any other charity. The IRS says they're going to look at that issue. That's one that's got them a little nervous. And then, again, the one that has them the most concerned is this issue about that Shanice talked about is should, should uh, DAFs be required to have a minimum distribution like a 5% in the same way that private foundations do? Um, anyone, when are you hearing in... in so um, we do not believe that those regulations should apply to community foundations. Um, we believe that it is much better that uh, community foundations as a field, that we come up with our own standards. Um, and so we have um, um, a regular accreditation process. Um, we're across 26 domains. Um, we, as experts in sort of deploying money and deploying capital and doing good, we determine what those uh, standards should be. Um, Again, in the case of the Baltimore Community Foundation, we have elected that we do think it's important to deploy capital. Um, again, we do know that there are reasons to grow your principal over time, but we will ask all of our donor advised funds in order to remain active, um, not to default to inactive status, um, that they deploy um, at least one gift over a five-year period, and that is our position. So a couple of questions have come in. Uh, Camille, um, or Shanice, I'll turn the first one to you. Uh, someone has asked... Um, whether we could revisit the concept of fees, or how typically does a community foundation charge annually for managing a DAF? Does it depend on the size of the DAF? Is it a scale, or how, do, how does it get structured generally? Uh, so for us, it is a sliding scale. scale. It's, so it's a tiered uh, fee structure um, based on the amount um, that um, uh, it's the opening amount and the, I guess, the rolling average over a certain period of time. I think I've got that right. Um, and obviously, once you have the economy of scale, um, the percentage that we charge in our fees um, is going to be less than um, if you're sort of only putting in a small amount. And that is largely because uh, the level of service does not necessarily change based on the amount. Um, and uh, just based on an operating, um, just on an operating basis, um, what we're able to provide um, to our uh, to our donor advised funds, our fund holders, as well as to the broader community, it actually doesn't actually hit 
um, what it takes for us to, uh, to operate. Um, that said, we're in a very competitive environment, and um, um, I think navel gazing um, will only get you so far, if anywhere. And so we want to make sure that, particularly as we look at the next generation and people are now acculturated to donor advised funds, that we can um, continue to be competitive within the market that's attracted to a community foundation. And so we will look over time at the balance between our fee structure and the level of services that people want and need, and we'll make sure that, that triangulates so that we're at some sort of market equilibrium. Um, but that that sort of conversation for us has just started. My question's been asked about whether a DAF can make a no-interest loan to victims of a disaster who've lost their homes or uh, below market loans, and, and, the, and the answer is yes, they can, just like any other. That's no different in effect than a charitable grant. And in fact, what we're seeing is, much like other charities, and again, I'll turn to you, um, that um, donor advice funds, community foundations are getting more involved in impact investing, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about some of uh, Yes, so um, uh, as I've said before, in, a vari in various contexts, um, the needs and the potential are great, um, and um, I think we're all recognizing that uh, uh, traditional philanthropy um, is not always the best way or the only way in order to uh, create impact. And so uh, Baltimore Community Foundation earlier this year made its first foray into the impact investing. Um, and we took um, a percentage of our fixed income class uh, of investments um, and we deployed them in the community in the forms of loans for small businesses, affordable housing, um, and um, uh, construction, et cetera, and, and things of that nature. Um, we uh, deploy our money through uh, CDFIs. Again, um, for us, it's sort of looking at the needs and who's at the best position to understand the, the who has the best knowledge in order to understand how to move and to make those impacts. So um, we've uh, identified five now uh, providers uh, that invest specifically in Baltimore, including in education um, and, and a few other areas um, in order to provide our loans. Um, and the expectation is that we believe that through this double return that we would get, for the most part, at least 3%. There's one instrument that we're looking to get 4 or 5% return. Um, but um, we're, we and our donors are willing to take the reduction in overall financial return because we expect the social returns to yield much long-lasting um, um, impact. And so this is sort of new for us. It's an exciting um, um, uh, opportunity for us to uh, make a difference in the community. And it's actually gotten a lot of energy from our donors. Um, they're members of our team that are actually working with some of our fund holders um, as they consider their giving that they actually want may, may want to consider giving to this class um, of, of investments um, as a different way of thinking about their philanthropy. Dave, you know, you like I'm not sure. Can folks see me? Here we go. Um, so I just wanted to go back uh, really briefly to um, the comment that you made about the uh, standards. Um, I believe you're referring to the um, National Standards for U.S. Community Foundations Accreditation Program, and that happens to be the program that me and my colleague run. Um, so that's thank you for mentioning that. And so just um, just to to focus on the criticism around DAFs in terms of payout or the fact that there isn't actually um, a requirement for a payout from DAFs. I'm curious, in your experience um, at Baltimore Community Foundation or even, you know, anecdotal information that you've heard from other community foundations, um, is there any kind of average percentage payout from DAFs that you've heard or that Baltimore Community Foundation um, uh, has experienced um, or, and or is it close, do you think, to that 5% um, again comparing to private foundations? So when we did our analysis to come up with the five-year policy that we recommended to the board, we didn't look at the 5% um, as a metric for thinking about payouts. We looked at um, a metric of inactivity based on the number of years, sort of the, the length of time um, that had lapsed before a gift was given out. And so we looked first at two years because that was the first recommendation uh, that we were going to submit. So our recommendation was going to um, be essentially that the fund would be deemed inactive um, if there were two years without, um, without a gift. Ultimately, we went to five years for some of the reasons that I explained. Um, but ultimately, we found that when we took, when we looked at all of our donor advised funds, about a little over 400, some, um, 400 uh, donor advised funds, the, the number that actually had not given a gift in two years was something like, I want to say it was like 20 or 30. 
I'm throwing out that number, but it was not substantial. So what we find is that donor advised funds at the Baltimore Community Foundation are very, very active. And then the small, so the finite number of cases where we found that there could have been a level of inactivity, um, it was often a successor issue. It wasn't a founder issue, um, which um, suggested to our team that we could be um, more strategic and intentional about making sure that we're really connecting with successors who may not be necessarily as connected to uh, the community foundation or as connected to the region. So that's what we found in our experience. You know, questions been posed um, as to is there any reason why a charitable organization should not avoid accepting gifts from DAFs um, or should avoid accepting gifts from DAFs and Short answer is I can't think of one. I mean, I guess it's no different than accepting a gift from anyone. I guess there's always a possibility that the money ultimately came from Bernie Madoff or some. But, but I, but you know, you'll never know that. So I, I can't think of any reason you would not accept a gift from a DAF. I think we had a question uh, back up, back there. Well, that's um, while we're waiting for the microphone. Um, it's also incumbent on the, upon the community foundation to, um, as they're creating a community of donors, what it means to have someone enter your community. And again, you trust your community foundation to make that decision. Um, and if someone of questionable intent approaches your community foundation, which can happen, um, it is your right to refuse the gift. A question back there? Hi. Um, so. As development professionals, we're always encouraged to build relationships with our allied professionals like the folks at Venable and, and also um, community foundation uh, officers. So Dr. Saul, Dr. Sauls, what, um, when the, the donor is anonymous and I send a thank you note or some follow-up materials or I have some hints about what their interests are in, uh, and I send them to you and say, you know, care of Dr. Sauls, do they actually get to the person or do they go in the circular file? And um, like, should I bother? And, and, and then when it comes time to, um, uh, this is for Robert, when, when you're in that panic in November, December, and you're not to the 5%, do you encourage your donors, like should I be building relationships with my allied professional trust officers and, and in hopes that they have that situation and they can say, gosh, you know, your, your mom was in hospice recently and you should give to Capital Caring. Um, you know, they, that would be a good thing and would make sense for you at this time. That would be a nice gift. Um, how often does that happen? Um, so those so I, are my two questions. I think I have the easier question. Um, <laughs> so generally speaking, um, just shorthand, it would go to the circular file. Um, again, for the most part, because we are a local community foundation, um, there's often a, another connection that the donor, the individual donor or donors um, um, are making with the, with the recipient, um, with the grantee, um, that could be at a, at a function, walkthroughs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in terms of the, you're, are you talking about the thank you anonymous. acknowledgement itself? I'm talking about anonymous donors. Oh, well, in that I'm case, trying to connect with who I don't know who they are. I just get a check and it's anonymous. I mean, of course I know who those, if, oh, if, I'm, if they're giving to me through you and I know who they are, then yeah, I'm communicating directly with them. But for the people who are main anonymous, I'm trying to build that relationship sort of through you. Should I bother? Are you forwarding that when it comes care of you to anonymous donor who just gave $1,000 to Capital Caring? Are you forwarding that to the donor? So it would depend on the arrangement that we have with the anonymous donor, but generally speaking, your relationship as the recipient of the grant would be with the community foundation. We would respect the, the donor's intent and their wishes. So your second question about how often do foundations find themselves at the end of the year and they haven't given away 5%, it happens a lot. It's, it, it just, for a variety of reasons, either that they just couldn't find things they wanted to do in that year, and it just weren't things that, and, or they waited too long to the end of the year, and finally, you know, a lot of, particularly family foundations, will sit down at Christmas and figure out what do we want to do this year, and they fall, and they realize they don't quite get there. So, yeah, it does happen. So, I, uh, when you're, when they call you back and say, if someone's short of money, if, if a foundation has not given away their 5% and they say, oh, what should we do? 
We will tell them that one option is this approach, give it to a donor advised fund, and then you could figure it out later where the money goes. Well, I'm, I'm, and I'm encouraging you not to do that, yeah, to, to, to you. give it to right. have a list of, of, of foundations or, or I mean, uh, charities that, that we, might we don't, be, we don't send them be proactive. We, right. we will, you know, frankly, to be perfectly candid, a lot of times what I'll do in my own practice is, if, uh, is, uh, is I'll call someone, say, at the community foundation, say, who's in need? Because Who, they know what charities in the community need money or have things going on. I'll say, tell me who needs, I've got somebody who has money to give. Who needs money right now? And it's a good resource for that kind of information. I've gotten some great advice that way. Yeah, that's right. And even private foundations come to us um, for that same, um, that same intel. Uh, and so we work with them. Um, so they can facilitate their giving. So, nice to. That's right. <laughs> so, the, you know, my final point, which, and then we'll we're happy to answer any questions, is that, look, th there's something coming out on deaths soon. We, we, I, I literally think it could be any day. I mean, the IRS has asked for comments on their proposals. People have sent in comments. I think, um, I think it's only a matter of time till we see something more. So, you know, keep your eye on, you know, it's, it's being widely reported what's going on. I think you'll hear more. Uh, you know, Congress appears to have some other things to do these days. But at some point, maybe uh, we'll see more coming out of it. But we're starting to see stuff coming out of the IRS now on other parts of the tax bill. So I think it's, it, you know, in the next, it literally could be any day, we'll see more on this. So we're happy to stay around for a little while and answer questions. Um, but thank you all for, for joining us today.